Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming this evening, a warm night. I'm very pleased to introduce Martha Rowe, the UK practitioner of the Pateco method. I met Martha two years ago when I was at a, a similar talk, and that enabled me to turn my health around and my life around. I um, <laughs> I can compete with a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Dear, we'll have to reduce its breathing. <laughs> Now, um, so, and Mar Martha's been working for, for five years. She's helped many, well, certainly hundreds of people reverse their, their chronic conditions. Mine is fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. Um, but we haven't got a lot of time. If anyone wants to discuss any of my experience later, but I'd be happy to, to do so. Um, meanwhile, I'm afraid she can't be in. Right. Um, meanwhile, we will pass around a form later on. If you would like to leave your email addresses, we shall email you after the talk. We can send you links to the presentations that we're showing now and other bits of information on our website. Um, and of course, this talk will go up on the NutriLink website, I think in about a week's about week so or so time. Um, I believe Stephen on holiday but anyway so it will be there as well um, if you would like more brochures um, please ask the gentleman at the back in the cream jacket and he'll give you some, some more um, I'm sure you'll find tonight's talk informative and I hope that it will help bring you to better health and well-being Martha Rowe. Well, thanks very much for coming to listen to what I have to say. Um, I had chronic fatigue syndrome, about 25 different symptoms that I lived with on and off, and I was so confused that I had no idea what was going on. Uh, I tried every kind of health, con health modality that you could possibly think of. I did get benefit, but not very much. And generally, the trend was, as I got older, I was getting worse. And I got to the age of about 50. I was about two stone heavier than I am now. Very confused, not really able to concentrate well enough to organise things. And I was a good organiser, a good manager. I was a teacher. I'd, I'd worked hard and uh, had been very competent in my time. And I was finding that my function was deteriorating at an extraordinary rate. And it was since I actually gave up work that I was getting worse. Working was helping me. Though the fatigue was so awful that I could only work part-time. I had to have one day on and one day off to collapse on the sofa. Um, and everybody was just amazed at how well I was doing. Like the acupuncturist I went to said, I don't know how you even stand up. The level of chi is so poor but it was just sheer will to keep going. And I was determined to find the solution because I knew there was a cause to my condition. My father was a, was a consultant physician. He was a respiratory physician, actually. My sister's a GP. My grandfather was a GP. And I watched people deteriorating in my own family as they got older. And I watched my father die hyperventilating. And my mother's respiratory center collapsed. So I knew that there was something going on about the breathing, but I didn't know because nobody knows anything about breathing. When I got contact with Christopher Drake, who actually promoted Bottega Method in this country first at the Hale Clinic, he came here in the 90s to introduce Bottega Method to this country and Europe and actually started doing workshops at the Hale Clinic. But they worked, you know, he and his teacher, Alexander Starmatsky, worked for about 10 years in this country and got very good results for asthma. But nobody was interested in uh, developing uh, practitioner training. They didn't want to train for the chronic conditions. 
the patients would come to the workshops for asthma and then when they get to the workshop they'd find their diabetes got better, their high blood pressure got better, their fatigue improved. So it was just by, you know, actually they were asthmatic and then as a result they got these bonus results afterwards. So um, my teacher worked for 10 years solidly with Alexander Starmatsky promoting this method in Australia. They did medical trials for asthma in Australia that were that published in the medical journals. And um, they got very good results for asthma. But they also were getting very good results for all the other 200 chronic diseases. And it's all based on a principle that has been left out of the medical, this should actually be in hospitals. It's a principle that's been left out, a physiological norm that has been left out. It's not being measured, and that is your breathing. You should be breathing three to four litres per minute. And I'll explain to you what that means. We Later on, we'll measure your breathing, and um, we can start to translate what your measure is in terms of litres per minute. But if you were breathing three to four litres per minute, you would be able to hold your nose really easily for 60 seconds with, in a very relaxed way. And I go around measuring people's breathing and not many people can get past 20 seconds. So most people in this culture are breathing three times more than is optimal. The other optimal norms that are measured by doctors and by health professionals is the blood pressure, which is 120 over 80 if it's optimal. Pulse, which when they started to investigate what gives optimal homeostasis, that means what gives the right sort of metabolic balance within the body, uh, it was actually 50 to 60 minutes per minute, but these days everyone's happy with 60 to 70 beats per minute. Athletes often have a low pulse, by the way. Temperature, the optimal temperature is um, uh, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Which is, which is in the well, about 37. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I always forget the Celsius, I'm afraid. So, 37 degrees Celsius. That's, that's what it should be. Now, if you actually go outside of these temperatures just by a few degrees, it has a major consequence on your health. Everyone's very concerned if the number of degrees increases by 4 degrees, for instance. It's, a real, it's serious. With blood pressure, if this starts to increase, particularly the lower number, it's considered very serious. But well, nobody's breathing, measuring the breathing. And all of you, I can assure you, in this room will be breathing three times more than is optimal, at least. And it is having slow deteriorating effects on your metabolism. Your homeostasis is shifting. The chemistry is shifting constantly through as you get older. Now, if you compare the breathing of a baby, the breathing of a baby is tiny, little breaths just at the tip of the nose. And their body sort of flickers. If you watch, they, they do this and they vibrate. If you go to a geriatric ward, they're heaving through the mouth. So you can see the difference between a baby and a geriatric or an elderly person, to be a bit more <laughs> polite. Um, and um, our aim is to help you to move towards the direction of the baby. And actually doing this process is not easy. Actually working with your breathing is not easy. First of all, you have to get your head around understanding breathing in a way that is completely alien because we are for carbon dioxide. We're actually advocates of carbon dioxide. We want you to increase your carbon dioxide level and your programming is to think that carbon dioxide is a waste gas. 
Well, in the case of your body, it's not. It's absolutely essential. You're made of carbon. If you lose carbon dioxide at too fast a rate, it will affect your carbonic acid levels. It will affect your pH. It will affect your oxygen levels in your muscles. And I'll explain this later. It will affect the, how calm your nervous system is. It will affect um, your immune system. It will affect the transport of hormones, endocrines, all kinds of large molecules all around your body. It will affect that. And people find when they come and do one of our workshops, which is done in a particular way and was devised by Professor Buteyko, and we follow his procedure, uh, you will find within two or three days that there will be changes. Very, very surprised. There will be significant changes if you do this practice. It looks strange, it feels strange, it's counterintuitive, but the results are good. Now, I found it very hard. I was a very difficult student, but I just persisted. I, I decided, well, I was just going to ignore anything that I came up with and just carry on regardless. And I kept going, and I found after nine months, I was singing and dancing like a child again, and I'd never felt so well in my life before. And I couldn't get up a hill without stopping regularly, and I was heaving big breaths, and now I can speed walk quite happily up a hill and when I get to the top I feel fantastic. I can use exercise to feel good, whereas before I found exercise was very debilitating and very painful because I had inflammation through my body that you would not believe. The pain level was very high. So, you know, and the inflammatory condition I had is called fibromyalgia and that's to do with a pH problem and to do with hypersensitive nervous system. And I found that by do, just changing my breathing bit by bit by bit, the pH problem went away, my muscles became oxygenated, and then I was able to function, my, the, the actual balance of carbon dioxide to oxygen was corrected enough to be comfortable in my skin. Practically for the first time in my life, actually, I've never felt so good. So something happened to me when I was a kid. That's all I can say. I don't know anything more than that. And it's not really much point in thinking about it. It's not too much point in getting into the stories. The best thing is to just try to understand what we have to say. Go away and think, think about it. Do some more investigation. And if you want to do a workshop, you'd be very welcome. We also do one-to-one -one training with senior practitioners via Skype. The workshop is run over five consecutive days, two hours each evening to build the practice. We build your practice over those five days. By the end of the five days, you will be able to begin your practice at home on your own. And then we follow you up for another three or four weeks after those five days by email, telephone, Skype, mobile, however you communicate. Um, you have to send scores. You have to send information about your symptoms and we follow you up and encourage you to keep going. We give you explanations as to what's going on, why you're experiencing what you're experiencing and then we have a reunion at the end of the month. And the price of that workshop at the moment is £425 and the next workshop is in September at Evolve Wellness Centre between the dates of 9th to the 13th of September and it starts at 6.30 in the evening. And Christopher Drake will be there via Skype. He comes on to the screen via Skype and oversees the workshop and answers your questions. Where is the wellness centre? It's in South Kensington. Oh, right there. Huh? What is this? South Kensington. Yeah. It um, takes how long, you said, for the 425? How many weeks? One week. Four weeks. Four weeks. Yeah, we give you five TV. sessions to build your practice. Mm -hmm. And three to four weeks follow-up with the practitioner. We give you individual coaching for three to four and weeks. And how many, how many hours per I don't per know. We, do, uh, we don't count it. It's just according to how the student responds to the oh, practitioner. Very, very yeah, it depends on the person. Some people can't be bothered to send okay. their scores and don't bother to get in touch with us. Other people are in touch every day. It depends. But the thing is, is we're there, we're thinking about you. We have you in mind, there'll be someone overseeing your progress. 
and you won't be disappointed. By the end of the month, you'll come to the reunion, you'll be staggered at the results. They're very good. That's all I can say, really. And it's all because we are working with this optimal norm, which is not being measured. So, you know, I, I can say hand on heart, anybody who does this practice, anybody who can do it, anybody who can follow the instructions, anybody who is willing to be trained and train their breathing will get the results. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this. And how do we establish the three to four litres per minute? Well, we'll, we'll, I'll measure your breathing in a minute. I'm going to show you a presentation by Christopher Drake to explain a bit about um, Professor Buteka, the kind of person he was, the kind of research he did. He was very thorough. Buteka was an expert on gas exchange. He's responsible for the atmosphere that was created in the Russian astronaut spacecraft. He's responsible for the atmospheres in deep uh, submarines. He's responsible for high-flying pilots and, and um, how they've survived at those heights. He worked it out. And he worked out that the more you breathe, the less oxygen you will have. And he did that on the back of other scientists' work beforehand, people like Christian Bohr and Henderson. You know, he's, but he just followed on. He took up the baton of this issue of breathing. Other people had done it in the past, but he took it up again. He met with yogis from northern India because Russia had a good relationship with northern India. He checked their breathing. He measured their breathing. He was an expert on measuring. He created machines to measure. That was what he did. And he then worked out a system for retraining the respiratory center, which is part of the brain, primitive part of the brain, in the medulla oblongata. And it's not an easy part of the brain to work with. It has a personality. It's combatant. <coughs> Uh, well, what we're doing is we're taking the breathing back to suspending the breath in the nostrils, which is what Patanjali talked about in his uh, suttas. Um, he talked about suspending the breath in the nostrils and becoming free from greed, that kind of... And that's what happens to people when they're when their breathing improves, they relax, they get less demanding, the whole personality changes. And um, so it is yoga, but the thing is, is that our breathing is far more, um, it, it, well, it, it, we're, our breathing is driving. It's the lack of um, sort of understanding about how the more you stimulate the system, the more you use your mind, the more you will breathe. The more uh, concepts that you have to deal with, the more you will breathe. And uh, I don't think people back in the day of the Buddha and Patanjali, that people had to do what we do. Like we've got to deal with emails, about 50 emails a day at least. We've got texts, we've got mobiles, we've got answer machines. You know, and then you've got kids with uh, things in their ears. They're on their mobile phone and they're revising and they've at the same time. I mean, this is like overload, overstimulation. When I was a child, I was sitting in a playpen on my own with a dolly and a teddy, I think. That was about as much stimulation I got. And I may have a wooden spoon and a saucepan if I was lucky to play with. But you see, uh, if the more you stimulate the system, the more you'll breathe. And also our food is toxic, so that's causing you to breathe. If you take medications, you will breathe more. If you have access to all sorts of environmental pollutants, you will breathe more. And if you breathe more over a long period of time, then your brain will recalibrate. It will become reconditioned. And your breathing will become stuck. So then you'll be breathing more. That will be it. You can't get back. So even if you breathe less in the day, you will breathe more at night because your respiratory centre will blow off the carbon dioxide that you've accumulated. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a problem about how you get back to what you were when you were younger. And that's the problem we address. So...
and show you the presentation. This is the first one. It's on the website, on the video page, so if you want to see it again or want to show it to other people, you can. Can you do the lights? attempt to present what we think is one of the greatest discoveries ever made, and an extraordinary approach to reversing chronic disease. In contemporary terms, it has become known as the Bateko Method, a system of breath training which so far has been proven to reverse asthma and many other chronic diseases. It started in the former Soviet Union more than 50 years ago when an outspoken medical scientist claimed he could treat all kinds of diseases with a breathing method. His name was Dr. Bottega and he and his method became legendary as tens of thousands of people all over the country learned his method, often claiming spectacular results. It came to the West in the early 1990s when Dr. Bottega's protege and chief practitioner, Alexander Stalmansky, began teaching it in Sydney, Australia. Since then, profoundly positive results have been reported in the media all over the world. Bateko practice has featured positively in major newspaper articles, television documentaries, and published medical journals in Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom, the United States, and Asia. These days, there are Bateko practitioners all over the world. Most sufficiently skilled to treat simple conditions, such as mild asthma. But only a small number who are qualified and experienced to treat severe and complex conditions. Learn Bateko has amongst the most qualified and experienced practitioners in the world, and we specialize in treating the most severe and complex conditions. But before explaining the approach, perhaps we should try to understand a little about the man who invented it and the monumental discovery upon which it is based. Dr. Konstantin Pavlovich Butega was an elite Russian medical scientist who was actively engaged in high-level research for the Russian military, space and sports programs. His specialties included high-altitude environments, respiration, the cardiovascular system, physiological measurements, and the development of diagnostic equipment. Suffice it to say that Dr. Buteka was not your average family doctor who stumbled on a simple health concept. In fact, he claimed to have made a discovery so vast that it would one day turn the whole of modern medicine on its head. And his obsession with it led him from being an elite and privileged scientist in the Soviet system to becoming a medical dissident. What was it that he discovered? Having an intense interest in sophisticated diagnostics, Dr. Bottega began an exhaustive investigation into the physiological and biochemical delineations between healthy and chronically ill people. The Institute of Clinical Experimental Medicine enabled him to use and develop facilities and equipment on a scale and sophistication that is usually reserved for high priority military research. Before going any further, we should clarify something. There are different categories of disease. There are contagious or infectious diseases, such as hepatitis, and there are diseases which are congenital, such as birth defects. 
and there are chronic diseases. Chronic diseases used to be called the diseases of civilization because they occurred with greater frequency in urbanized or more civilized communities and have grown with the so-called modernizing of human society. Chronic diseases are conditions such as asthma, allergies, bronchitis, cancer, chronic fatigue, depression, diabetes type 2, emphysema, high blood pressure, hormonal problems, migraine, and systemic problems such as MS and lupus. In fact, some 200 conditions fit into the category of chronic disease. There are some 30,000 diseases known to modern medicine. But chronic diseases only number around 200. But by far, they are the most prevalent and cause the most suffering for contemporary human beings. Dr. Boteco's research and subsequent method mainly applies to chronic disease. Coming back to Dr. Boteco's discovery, what was it that he discovered? It was that one particular parameter indicated chronic disease more than any other. And that parameter was the level of carbon dioxide within the human organism. Carbon dioxide But isn't carbon dioxide a deadly pollutant? No, that's carbon monoxide, a different substance entirely. But there are claims that carbon dioxide is a pollutant because it occurs in industry. When in fact most of it occurs naturally and is a vital part of all organic life. Dr. Botego's research showed that when a subject had an optimal level of carbon dioxide, they never suffered with any chronic disease whatsoever. But all subjects that sustain any one of the several hundred chronic disease permutations all shared one attribute, a lower than optimal level of carbon dioxide. Furthermore, the greater the deficiency of carbon dioxide, the worse or more severe their disease and or subsequent level of health. In other words, Dr. Bottega discovered a linear relationship between chronic disease and the level of carbon dioxide within the human organism. This discovery stunned him and gave him the direction for his future research. According to established medical textbooks, the physiological norm or optimal level of carbon dioxide in the human organism is around 7% a very sharp contrast to the level in our atmosphere of around 0.035%. Roughly speaking, the human organism requires around a 200 times greater concentration of carbon dioxide than what is in the air that we breathe.
Okay, so I'm going to um, try and draw, so you know, do bear with me. <coughs> So we call that the respiratory centre, okay? It's in the back of the brain. It's actually in the um, brain stem. Uh, it's in the medulla oblongata, part of the brain. And it's very sensitive to carbon dioxide levels. You see, you, how many people are familiar with the idea that the more you breathe, the more oxygen you will get? Everyone, right? And that seems logical because when you go running or if you walk quickly, you breathe more. Mm -hmm. So it seems like you need to breathe more to get more oxygen. Well, the problem is, is that's all incorrect. What's happening when you're doing exercise is carbon dioxide is building up in your lungs. This thing is being triggered uh, because it's, the carbon dioxide level has got to a, a level where it thinks it's time to breathe. And so, of course, your, driven, your breathing is driven. Well, to breathe optimally, you should actually have 7% carbon dioxide in your lungs coming back into the lungs from the blood before this is triggered. If you were breathing 3 to 4 litres per minute, you wouldn't breathe until the carbon dioxide level in the lungs had got to 7%. But what's actually happening is, is that people are breathing by the time the carbon dioxide level has got to 4%, 4.5%, 5%. 5 5% would be quite good in this day and age. If it, if it gets to the point of uh, how you, your system, your, your respiratory centre starts to breathe when the carbon dioxide level is at 3.5%, then you're at a very dangerous level then, because that's when the respiratory centre can crash, and the whole system, you know, you go into what's called metabolic alkalosis, you become too alkaline. So, what we're concerned about is finding out how sensitive this is to carbon dioxide. Now, the uh, video said that the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere is equal to 0.035%, which is equivalent to 350 parts per million. And those of you who've been following the global warming thing, they're all saying that now carbon dioxide levels are 400 parts per million, so it's 0.04% in the atmosphere. Still a lot less than what it needs to be in your lungs before you breathe. And the only organ between the air and your blood is the lungs. That's the only organ between the air and your blood. And the amazing thing about this organ is it has an enormous surface area, as big as a football pitch. It, its structure is built to accumulate the correct mix of gases for your blood. But we're taught that you should pump these lungs in order to get more oxygen, just like a, you know, a machine, a car, a combustion engine, that you should be pumping them like the cylinders in a combustion engine in order to get more oxygen. But actually what you should be doing is actually reducing your breathing as much as you can whilst you're doing exercise in order to accumulate the carbon dioxide, in order to, accum to actually benefit from the carbon dioxide that you make. You make carbon dioxide. You're a manufacturer of it. And your, the aim is, is to keep it, not to lose it. It's your treasure. So, you know, you've got this great big foamy organ, or two of them. They're just, they're really foamy. When you poke them, they spring back at you. They're sponges. And they're full of gas. And the aim is really to not lose it. Now, if you've got to the point where you're resorting to mouth breathing, you can see the distance from your mouth to the windpipe is quite short. So if you're a mouth breather, and if you watch the younger generation, they're all mouth breathers, all of them. And they're very vulnerable because their breathing is deteriorating faster than ours is because of the stimulation, because of their mental activity, because of philosophy, because of toxic food, because of these constant machines that they're on, 
you know, and, and their breathing is, re they're really quite in a very vulnerable position at the moment. I work with uh, teenagers quite regularly and children. They get fantastic results very quickly. They're very easy to work with. They like this. They get results quickly. And if they've got a particular problem they want to get rid of, then it makes complete sense and they get very good results very quickly. So it, it's good work working with young people. But if they don't get to find out about this, then their health will just deteriorate as they get older because their breathing is already seriously out of, out of kilter. <coughs> so um, the way the breathing mechanism should work, you should breathe through your nose only, always through your nose. This way uh, you keep a little vibration at the tip of the nose and this way the vibration just shunts through all the vessels in the skull and the carbon dioxide level is built up in the skull as well as oxygen mixed up very close to the brain and and then it shunts down the windpipe and it's like this is a reservoir you want to see your breathing system as a reservoir that you want to maintain and keep your breathing pattern at the tip of the nose now you try and do that it's very hard really really hard because this thing is usually very oversensitive to carbon dioxide as it builds up in the lungs. It comes out of the blood and builds up in the lungs. And this thing forces you to breathe too soon. And the sensation you get when your system wants to breathe is suffocation. It's horrible. And it also creates symptoms of anxiety. So your anxiety levels increase as you breathe more. The less you breathe, the less anxious you will become because you'll have less of that symptom. So if you see these three lines as your intercostal muscles, and this line at the bottom is your diaphragm, the way it works is you build up carbon dioxide in the lungs. The carbon dioxide is picked up by the respiratory centre, and the respiratory centre causes you to mechanically breathe. That's how breathing works. You think that oxygen needs to be uh, obtained, and we're saying that you need to keep your carbon dioxide. So it's a very different message from what you've heard before. Now we can measure your breathing, and this measure is called a control pause. Now it's the time that you can actually still control your breathing very easily. So we ask you to take a normal breath in through the nose and out through the nose to relax, pinch your nose, keep your mouth closed, just pinch your nose and wait until you get the first difficulty, until it just feels that you can no longer control your breathing. It's no longer relaxed. And then you let go. And Marcel will put the clock on and she'll call out the time and when you let go, you remember that time, that number of seconds and we'll tell you how much on average you're breathing per minute. So, everybody wants to get in a comfortable position. Breathe in. And out. Yeah, we'll go through it again, don't worry. We're going to breathe in through the nose, a normal breath. Out. A normal breath it's sort of until don't push the air out you just relax it out hold your nose but not yet because we're going to we're going to put the clock on you see but Marcel will lead you into it comfortable and relaxed just speak up, be comfortable and relaxed you can you demonstrate to... once please so we know Normal breath in and out and hold. That was seven seconds. Say I need to do that for seven seconds. I might wait till I might not need until late to, to breathe until later. So you keep, you keep holding until that first desire to breathe. Has anyone got an idea of what to do now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, great. 
No. Breathe in, breathe out, <laughs> hold the nose, your mouth closed. I will count out the seconds. Yeah. You let go when you need to breathe and remember the number of seconds that I have pulled out when you need to breathe. You need to shout all the time, okay? Let's <laughs> <laughs> get the hoover going. <laughs> okay, right. Relax. Normal breath in, normal breath out, and hold the nose. Two, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, <coughs> fifteen, seventeen, nineteen, twenty-one. Okay, he did a maximum pause, not a control pause. Okay, yeah, so well, he's, he to yeah, yeah. So, so, so his his respiratory centre is very flexible, which is a good sign. I mean, he'll find these pauses because we take the pauses up to about two minutes. So, um, you know, gradually, not steadily and gradually. And some people have a very flexible respiratory centre, um, and you might find that you can't do it again. <laughs> so. Um, but most people had a control pause of less than 20. If you notice, most people had let go by that time. Now, if you, um, well, before I go on to explain, I just wanted to point out to you, I didn't say how much oxygen there is in the atmosphere. There's 21% oxygen in the atmosphere, and you only need 2% oxygen in your lungs. So you've already got 10 times more oxygen that is, than is actually needed. So you're never short of oxygen. You have no problem getting oxygen onto your haemoglobin. It's getting it off the haemoglobin that is the problem. And that's what we address. Because that's where carbon dioxide comes into it. And I'm going to have to rub this out now so that we can go on to explaining how... we can uh, convert this control pause. Now, if you were breathing optimally, you'd have a control pause of 60 seconds. So you'd be able to do that easily with no pressure, no pressure at all. You had pressure, mm. didn't you? Not on 60. You didn't on 60? No, 75, I just... You, you had, yeah, you, you, yeah. Had, you, you, get, but you breathed a lot after 75. Yeah. So when you let go after control pause, it's a normal breath. Yeah. Very light. It shouldn't be difficult at okay. all. So um, 60 seconds is your control pause if you're actually breathing like a baby. 
if you're breathing double six to eight meters per minute, that would give you a control pause of 30 seconds. Mm. Now, you wouldn't really have any signs of serious chronic disease if you have a control pause of 30 seconds. This is where problems start. Are you saying that a baby breathes every 60 seconds? It's not no, like that. that. No, the breathing pattern is like a wobble here. They, they do these little wobbles. We're talking volume. We deal with volume. We don't worry about breathing numbers of breaths and all that because it keeps changing. And with every mood and every thought, your breathing changes. I mean, the Buddhism is a study of that, you know. They, they studied... Uh, the breath. That's what Anapanasati is, the Buddhist approach to breathing, and it's all about watching breathing and watching how breathing changes. 9 to 12 meters per minute is equivalent to a controlled pause of 20 seconds. Now this is where the chronic disease starts. This is where you've got an asthma attack. This is where the system starts to show signs that there's a problem with carbon dioxide deficiency. Then you can get uh, as low as 18 to 24 litres per minute. This is a control pause of 10 seconds. This is serious, this is a zone of serious chronic mm. disease and once it gets lower it gets da dangerous. Because you could uh, quite easily find yourself in the middle of the night when you tend to hyperventilate between the hours of 3 to 6 a.m. in the morning when you're sleeping you tend to breathe a lot at that time that's when most people go into heart attack and stroke they end up in accident and emergency in the early hours of the morning but why would it happen at that time in the morning because at that point the respiratory center drives the breathing because if you've been building up carbon dioxide during the day it will make you lose it at night in those hours and if you actually wake at that time a lot of insomniacs wait, wake at about 4 mm. when they've been hyperventilating and they feel agitated and hot and uncomfortable What about sleep apnea? Sleep apnea is a defence mechanism, the body's defence mechanism it makes you stop breathing so that you can build up carbon dioxide <coughs> so it's another defence mechanism, asthma is a defence mechanism, bronchus spasms to try to get you to breathe more shallow. So this is a zone of serious chronic disease and then once the control pause gets down to five seconds we call that 999 job. <laughs> and we get quite a few of those in our workshops and they get very good results. But if your control pause is 30 and under you could do with doing something about it. If you can get your control pulse to 35 and stable, we aim to get people to that position because that's kind of our first aid approach. If you want to go higher, then you, it's best to do some work with the mind because you need to incorporate the mind and the diaphragm because it's mind, diaphragm, breath that we're working with. But first we work with diaphragm doing breath holds. And that's our first aid approach, trying to get the control pause up to 30 and above. And then at that point, the mind will have calmed down, your perspective will have changed, and it'll be much easier to do mental practice. And mental practice is very good at getting the control pause up. Christopher's particularly good at doing, uh, to teaching about the mind. He's, he's, he's very clear and it's very practical. There's no, um, uh, we're, not, we're not trying to get anybody involved in any particular way of thinking, but to actually practice what he suggests and then you'll see your control pulse go up. It's very technical, very practical. And if your control pulse goes up, you'll feel different. Every time it goes up, you feel different. We have quite a few students in this room. Would you like to put your hands up so that people can see? There's quite a few people in this room that have already done this work. All right, so and they've all they've got the results. And they come to talks to actually just to refresh their memory as to why they're doing this, because it's very easy to forget. I mean you your brain will try to stop you doing this practice. 
it'll work against you because it's quite happy with the way you are. It doesn't want you to change. I tried doing this on my own and I found it almost impossible. It is impossible. <laughs> it's, it's okay doing it, much easier doing it in a group. James has a, um, where are you James? He's got a support group that he runs every Monday night in Soho and people get together on Mondays to discuss their practice and to just meet with other people doing this because it helps. Um, so, you know, that's the situation with the control force. So normal breath in, normal breath out, hold your nose and let go when you get the first impulse to breathe. Now we can do a maximum pause and we can calculate what your control pause is from maximum pause. So if you um, would like to do the exercise again and this time you hold on and on and on and on and on and on until you're busting <coughs> and remember the number you get to and then we'll, we'll work out what your control pause is from there. <coughs> okay, so if everybody's relaxed and comfortable again, we'll do a bit of normal breath in, out, hold the nose as long as you can till you're busting. So, take a normal breath in and out and hold the nose. Five. Eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, nineteen, twenty-one, twenty-three, twenty-five, twenty-seven, twenty-nine, <coughs> thirty-one, thirty-three, thirty-five, thirty-seven. 6 68, 70, 72, 74, 76, 78, 80, 82, 84, 86. <laughs> Sorry. She's lost it. Sorry. Yeah. 97. 90 wow. 97. 97, okay. Very good. Has she been practicing as a lady, had she? She was a student, was it, then, when you got to that level? No, 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 the gentleman oh. behind oh, you. Okay. Yeah, behind you, yeah. Okay, so if you take that number and halve it, that's your control clause. So if you're, you got to 40, then your control clause would be 20. <laughs> because we find that for people who've not done this practice, that the and they've they've never done maximum pause before, uh, we it, it, there's a calculation that you can do that, that if you can hold for. Sorry, I'm not I'm not making sense. <laughs> um, if you hold your breath for as long as you can and halve it, that's pretty accurate. Mm. And you'll find that um, yeah. your half your maximum pause is about your control pause. So what was your maximum? Mine was, no, it wasn't. Mine was, my maximum was, uh, oh God, what was it now? So I was 20, 28 the first one, yeah. and 28 and 35 the second. Okay, well you need so to half the 35, half the so, so, so that's about so that's 17. Oh, yeah, 17 seconds. Is so what did I have to mean? Okay. Yeah. What does that mean? So that means I was forcing it before. Yeah, you were forcing it without realising it. Yeah. So what was? Uh, does anyone else want to volunteer their maximum pause? What was your maximum? Okay. Well, then you have that. It's about twenty-five. Your control pause is around twenty-five. 
41, you have that's about 20, your control force is about 20. So what is the significance then? Because originally, you know when we did it first, it was, I got about 100. Yeah, that's because you've never then, done it before. And then the second one, only 60. Yeah, that's right, so your control force is about 30. 30. Now, what is, what is the significance of 30? Yes, I'll, I'll answer your question in a minute when they've stopped talking. You'll be here for a few minutes. Excuse me, why, why is it the control force? What is the meaning of control force? Well, I, I drew a, a, a diagram of the brain with a respiratory center, which is in the medulla oblongata, in the sort of brain stem area of the brain. And we were testing for the sensitivity of that area of the brain to carbon dioxide. Now if you hold your nose for 10 seconds and then you get the urge to breathe, that means that your respiratory sense is very sensitive to carbon dioxide. It's making you breathe at very low levels of carbon dioxide, at a low percentage. If, on the other hand, you hold your nose for 60 seconds easily, you will have 7% carbon dioxide in your lungs before you breathe. Your breathing centre will not drive your breathing until the carbon dioxide level is at about 7%. And it's a bit like, you know, if you go uh, 20 miles an hour over 15 minutes down a road, you can work out what distance you've gone. It's that kind of calculation. So we can hold our breath uh, for a certain number of seconds, that will tell us how much we're breathing on average throughout the day. That's a manoeuvre, it's a mathematical manoeuvre that Bottega came up with in his calculations. And Alexander Starmatsky in North Sydney was up against a whole team of uh, medical practitioners who were measuring a patient's breathing with all kinds of machinery and they were calculating how much that person was breathing and uh, Starmatsky did it with his stop clock because of Bottega's calculation. But they got the same result from all doing the tests with all the machinery. So just by doing this today gives yeah. us our normal, <coughs> what is normal for each one of us. Yes, yeah, so your control pause, I mean... 42. Your, so oh, no, I was 84. So yes, yeah, so it's about 42, 42 yes. But it may be that you've got a very flexible respiratory centre. It does mm. need checking. Yeah. Check it from time to time I'm throughout the day. Working, I don't breathe, I forget to breathe. Mm. I'm fine, and I think, oh, I haven't breathed for ages. Mm. I just don't need to. Yeah. But take it first thing in the morning when you wake yeah. up. Find out what it is when you yeah. wake up, because you may yeah. find that it's there's a big swing. Yeah. Um, in, to answer to your question, is that sometimes the first time when you do this you can hold on and on and on and on forever it, it can just shoot through because mm -hmm. the respiratory center is not picking it up mm -hmm. and okay. some people's sensitivity will not be very good so you know it, when you start the practice your sensitivity gets better and better as time goes on people with COPD and emphysema don't have any sensitivity to carbon dioxide they can hold on for ages sometimes mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, because their respiratory centre is completely crashed. Mm. If you are on a CPAP machine, you still suffocate sometimes and you want to remove it and breathe the normal air. You got sleep apnea? Well, uh, within two weeks, you'll have that sorted out if you do the workshop. And you won't ever have to wear one of those things again. <laughs> so, but also, sorry, if, if I could see how you breathe, is it quite. Can you tell us how is it quite shallow? Yeah, there's just a wobble here. So doesn't this move and will your tummy move? Yeah, my tummy, is everything, tummy my whole body is sort of, the whole body breathes. It's yeah. like a little, because the mechanism comes. very short. Yeah, very short. Vibrate, vibrations. Yeah. There shouldn't really be much muscle movement, but the muscle movement starts here, and then the belly extends a bit as you breathe in, and it goes up. Up, up to the armpits, the ribs expand a bit. But you don't have much space between them. You don't have much space between the breaths. Well, it's a wobble. Oh, it's constant. Just, yeah. <laughs> so would you say that the deep breathing that's recommended by just by every culture um, is harmful? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody's driving people to breathe more. Mm. 
Mm. And yoga, fundamental yoga, is shallow breathing. That's what yoga is. Mm. Mm. That's the teaching, is shallow breathe. Mm. Asana is about doing physical maneuver in order mm. to reduce your breathing. You should be breathing very little so you for meditation. in asana. And Patanjali's suttas actually state that you should be able to hold your breath for two minutes before you practice asana. The thing is, is that nobody's able to hold their breath for two minutes, so that rule's been dropped because otherwise you couldn't make business. I mean, I'm not, I'm not against exercise classes, people getting together and stretching and all that, but to actually call it yoga is not it's not correct and Pilates breathing is in through the nose out through the mouth draw your belly button to your spine so that's contradicted all that that's gone mm. yeah so when we do breath holds you get you build up a really strong torque right through it's like your rope is is pulled and you'll find that your core muscles will become very strong and um, within weeks you'll find your muscle tone will improve enormously so what do you do when you run you shallow breathe. We train you to do, first of all, speed walking. So speed walking, doing shallow breathing, and gradually you'll train your breathing into being able to run. Mm -hmm. And when swimming? Same, same. You can breathe through your nose quite easily. I've, I've trained quite a few students who just swim, breathing through their nose. You have to breathe to a particular style and freeze the stroke while you turn your head to take a little breath through the nose. But you need to get your breathing retrain first and then you can train your breathing in the context of physical training and we'll take a train the Olympic team in Russia Chris has trained many Olympic athletes the less you breathe the better Jack has trained loads of marathon runners you can run a marathon breathing through your nose quite easily you'll have no muscle fatigue you'll be able to run a marathon the next day and you will have enjoyed your performance very much. <laughs> <laughs> what if you have a cold? If you have a cold? Well, if you had a high control pause, you wouldn't have a cold. I haven't had a cold for five years. Wow. Yeah. Is it related also to the relaxation of, of the body? So you were saying the mind and the body are related. That relaxation is crucial to to stop the signals of saying, yes, I must breathe in, or an impulse to say, so... Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is carbon dioxide is a sedative. And if you're short of carbon dioxide, you become hypersensitive and anxious. So the more carbon dioxide you have, the more relaxed you'll become. But at night, you breathe quite... Sometimes when I wake up, I'm, I'm aware that my breath is quite deep breathing. Yeah, that's right, because it's driving at night. Your respiratory centre drives. The most dangerous time for breathing is between 3 and 6 a.m. And that's the time that we train people, often get them up in the middle of the night to practice. Sure. Because you'll find that four hours sleep is enough when you do this practice. And you'll get up at 3, you'll do your practice and you'll feel fine. It's not sleep that gives you energy, it's carbon dioxide that gives you energy. Do this have addictions? Yeah. Very good for food addiction. Alcohol. Yeah, because it's to do with sugar levels. Can we eat kinds of things? Pardon? Just eat the kinds of things. Dioxide? Well, um, you know, sometimes we use things like bicarbonate of soda to help with nausea. Right. But it's, but it, you know, it, it's temporary. You see, we're talking about changing breathing. We breathe 20 to 30,000 times a day. And if you reduce your breathing, we're talking about changing the breathing pattern. So that you change the volume that you breathe, so that you lose less carbon dioxide. So most people are breathing like this. We would like you to breathe like this. All right, so that you don't lose the carbon dioxide. You want to keep this area looked after. This is your entrance to the reservoir. This you look after. You keep this very relaxed and keep it reduced as much as you can. So if you've got an old injury like a fracture, so it hasn't healed very well, what 
this happen. Yeah. Yeah. It'll get worse and then it'll get better. Any injury gets better. So the benefits of this. And then we'll watch the next video. The benefits are that you will increase your oxygen levels in your muscles. The pH throughout your whole body will improve. The nervous system will calm down. The synapse in between nerves and brain cells will become more orderly and more efficient. Your immune system will become active. So can you eat McDonald's now and still be healthy? <laughs> you wouldn't want to eat McDonald's. No, I do. No, I mean, I you know. really wouldn't want to eat I'm, McDonald's. I know. But I'm, no, but I, your tongue would not want it. I'm huh? saying that. What about rubbish food then? You wouldn't want to eat it. No. You really wouldn't. You'd feel sick. Okay. When you do this method, your body rejects anything that's poisonous. Or oh, you, you think McDonald's is poison. <laughs> <laughs> I can't eat McDonald's. <laughs> beef steak's good, if it's good quality beef. I'm all for eating meat, but it's got to be good quality. And, and the right dose. Uh, all the tubes in your system, bronchus, blood vessels, gut vessels, bladder vessels, reproductive vessels will all open. When you do this practice, everything opens and relaxes. Nerves relax, all vessels open. So you take into consideration all the conditions that will involve. We're looking at migraine, headaches, high blood pressure. <coughs> We're looking at constipation, IBS, infertility. We're looking at all kinds of lung conditions. Mm. We're looking at brain function. Thyroid. Thyroid is hormones. Yeah, hormones. So it that rebalances all hormones. Cholesterol. Cholesterol. Cholesterol is a kind of mucus and it's thickening the blood. The quantity of nitric oxide. Sorry? Does it improve the quantity of nitric oxide? Well, there's a lot of talk about nitric oxide and I d I'm not an expert so I can't really answer that question. But you'll find that the carbon dioxide levels, when they change, have a big, they make a big difference to how you feel. And we go by how people feel. We function. Our, our whole thing is about you do the practice and work with how you feel. It's all done on your feedback. So can you say something about cholesterol? Yeah, cholesterol is a kind of mucus produced by the liver and it thickens the blood. And it, the idea is that the blood gets slowed down so that you don't lose so much carbon dioxide. So when people do this method, as long as they get the pauses up to about 80, 90 seconds, they will have no issues with cholesterol at all. Your blood will thin automatically because of the higher levels of carbon dioxide. Well, it's quite complex actually because the measurements that they make uh, are not very accurate because they. It, because sometimes the liver is producing more cholesterol as a compensation mechanism and the levels can go up but the blood flow is perfectly okay, the viscosity is fine because of the elevated carbon dioxide. Because really what they're most concerned about is not the cholesterol, it's the viscosity of blood because it leads to clotting. But with this method you won't get clotting because carbon dioxide reduces the viscosity of blood and you'll know it because when you cut yourself it bleeds uh, quite um, vigorously. <laughs> How many times a day do you practice? Four. Mm -hmm. Twenty minutes it takes in the first week and then you can start working out how to get it done in ten. Excuse <laughs> <laughs> me. Sorry, I'm just a bit confused about this oxygen bit. Because yeah. Because that says cell oxygen here, you know, yeah. liquid form. Yeah. So why would they do that? I mean, why would they not sell carbon dioxide? Yeah, well, the thing about oxygen is you feel better. If you've got problems with breathing, you feel better yes. when you take it. Yes. Uh, and in the short term, oh, it's short helpful. Term. Right. But in the longer yes. term, it will destroy your health. 
Right. Because you'll start to breathe more and more and you'll need to take more and more oxygen. No, no, it's liquid form, in liquid form I'm talking about. You know, oh, you mean you drink it? Form. Yes. You drink it? Drops. Oh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> drops. You put drops in water. I don't know much about that. No, no, it's okay. Yeah, I do know about this though. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, oxygen, pH, nerves, nerve to brain cell, immune system, vessels, hormones. Have I missed all, all the systems. Yeah, digestive all the systems, system. the digestive system, yeah. Mm. Um, so, you'll find that your whole general health will improve dramatically. You'll sleep better, you'll eat less, you'll be able to do more, you'll have more energy. You'll become better at concentrating. You'll be happier in yourself, generally. The process is not pleasant. And the immune system becoming more active poses a bit of a problem. Because you think that's a good idea, but in actual fact what happens is, is as the rate of bonding between antibodies and antigens improves, then your immune system starts to clean up all the toxins and the infections that haven't been cleaned up because you have a low control pause. So when you start this method, your body starts going into spring cleaning, what I call spring cleaning. And if you've got a backlog of 20 years worth of spring cleaning, it can be rather unpleasant. But you'll find that once the spring cleaning is over, you'll feel better. Then you'll get another bit of spring cleaning, then you'll feel better. Another bit of spring cleaning, you'll feel better. Immune system, you can put about immune system illness, for example, grave disease or myasthenia gravis. It's helping also in this. Yeah, way. any autoimmune disease is, is helped it's because the immune system is this grave yeah. disease and myasthenia yeah, gravis. If you have a low level of carbon dioxide, <coughs> yeah. the rate of bonding between antibodies and antigens yeah. becomes uh, reduced, yeah. reduced, reduced, and more chaotic. The body and the mind is being bombarded by allergens, all kinds of outside things all the time. So the immune system is having a hard time if you have low carbon dioxide. And do you, you tell me healthy in autoimmune illness? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Well, Christopher Drake had um, Crohn's disease, that's an autoimmune condition. Ulceration of the colon. You said the, this system has got any uh, an effect on the viscosity of the blood. Yeah. Does it... Uh, it reduces the viscosity. The viscosity. If yeah. you have got ten, thick blood, then yes. it becomes too... Yeah, it becomes more liquid as soon as you start no. this practice, yes. Mm. You wouldn't take rat poison, would they? Mm? People would have to take rat poison, the horrible stuff that thins the blood, if it is this method. Well, they wouldn't have to take, you mean what, that aspirin. stuff called warfarin. Warfarin. Yeah, warfarin. yeah no, warfarin, warfarin. It's, it's rat poisoning. Yeah, well, yes. Buteyko was very anti playing around with the blood at all. He said it should not be played around with. This is the way you manage the blood, is to do Buteyko method, because you affect the blood directly every time you do your practice. Mm. And he was dead against uh, anyone doing transplants, because he said that once you do that, then we can't really help them. Because they have to take auto, they have to take immune suppressants mm. in order to keep mm. keep keep the organ that they've had transplanted. Mm. So our view is that when someone's coming up towards a transplant, they should actually start this in order to see if they can start to. Not many people know about it. It's, they just don't know about it. Mm. No. Well, we're doing our best. Yeah, that gives them high blood pressure, so then their blood vessels burst. No, blood pressure is okay, it's long nights. Yeah, but the blood, the blood, the nose, yeah, but you'll find that the blood pressure will have been affected on the plane. And then the, the blood vessels will burst. It's very temporary, it's very, you know, it goes, it fluctuates very quickly. And the reason why is because when you're flying, you breathe more. Flying is very dangerous for breathing, actually. We give special instructions for reducing your breathing on a plane journey. Yeah, but it's really, really, you know, we don't eat on the plane. We don't drink much except keep the mouth wet. We, we practice our pauses. We practice on the plane. 
and we try to breathe as little as possible on a plane. Do you do meditation? Sure. Watching the breath is meditation. Mm -hmm. Does it help eyesight, you know, cataracts? And yeah, yeah, glaucoma as well. What you do? Yeah. Mm. Someone has got a stent and is a smoker. Yeah, it's fine. Okay? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, smoking's not such a problem as people think. We've had problems with smoking. Yeah. No, drinking is more of a problem. Sniffing. Hmm? Sniffing. What, cocaine? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you mean sniffles? No, no. Mm. You know the stuff like the tobacco. Oh, snuff. Ah, snuff. Snuff. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, because I have a mother in law, she's not very free. She's always on that drug. Yeah, well, don't worry about it. It's, <laughs> it's not like drink. Drink is more dangerous because it has to go through the liver. Overeating, well, overeating is more dangerous. <coughs> so, is it to avoid drinking or reduce it? Well, best thing is to do the method, and then you'll self, you'll start to self-regulate. Because the thing is, is once you start elevating carbon dioxide, you don't have to decide on anything. You'll just start behaving differently. It all. The wonderful thing is, is it just goes through the process, and you gradually find that you can manage your thoughts and feelings far better. You can relax much more. You don't need to eat so much. You don't have to sleep so much. You can sleep better quality, but shorter periods of time. You can work for longer hours. Uh, you can work in the middle of the night if you want. You can go to any country across the world and you won't have jet lag. You can speed, you can speed walk up a hill and you can get to the top and you can feel absolutely brilliant because you, when you get the balance of reduced breathing and exercise it's exhilarating it's really extraordinary did you say we should eat less yeah sure mm. there's too much consum consuming mm. going on mm. we're living in a consumer society it's a profit making society yeah. and so therefore we're being driven to buy mm. buy buy the less you breathe the less greedy you become and the less disappointed you are with life the more you'll observe it just as it is what about Alzheimer's or dementia? Yeah, we, we treat Alzheimer's, yeah. We can help the progression. We can slow up the progression of Alzheimer's because that's plaque in the brain. Yeah. yeah, well, it's the same as the plaque in the teeth and it's to do with a pH problem. Well, it's all it's bed this. Hmm? Bed bounded, very old. How can you help that? Well, um, it's a bit of work, but it has been done, but it needs, you know, I've got... Um, if they have a carer who will do it with them and keep working steadily through the day doing practices, that will work. I've got someone in Ireland doing that now without Alzheimer. His daughter's done the practice and she's doing it with him every time. He can do it because he can't remember what he's got to do, so she has to mm -hmm. remind him each time. <laughs> yeah? On the sleeping aspect, now you say you, you, you don't need more than six hours. That's right. If you have a high control pulse, and uh, many of the books, I think they recommend eight. You need eight That's hours. That's right. Sleep. Yeah, yeah. So we're all being asked to eat breakfast, lunch, supper, and to sleep eight hours a day. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the formula. You don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. I eat once a day mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. most. Mm -hmm. That's all you oh, need. Do you drink once in a day. Drink. So I drink. So you only need what alcohol? So <laughs> yeah, I do. I drink okay. fluids when I'm thirsty. I drink when I'm thirsty, I eat when I have appetite, I sleep when I'm tired, when my eyelids are dropping, I sleep, I wake when I wake. And, and you know, it's about, it's about understanding that if you go to this formula, if you do anything in a routine, it will work against the metabolism, the metabolism will get sick. So even with medications, for people who are taking medications, Buteka's view was that you keep changing the dose, you never give the same dose keep changing it in order to keep uh, the, the dynamic of all the chemical reactions moving and shifting and changing because it's a constant flux. We're in a, so once you get into a routine, the system becomes wooden. So what if I started to breathe less every minute, not your way because I don't know your way, would that be better than breathing a lot? Sure. Best is to keep your mouth shut at all times. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. no, but I mean, really, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and to learn how to breathe through your nose when you're talking, 
Do you use your tongue to block your, your airways mm -hmm. when you're talking? So you stop talking, you put your tongue listening. on the top palate, take a sniff through the nose. And that's how you that's how you breathe when you're talking. Tape your mouth at night so you don't breathe through your mouth at night. And and Tom. you look after your breathing. It is hard, but if you do the workshop, you'll have all the skills in a month. You'll have it. So basically, this method can improve snoring. If somebody does. Oh yeah, snore, anyone who snores, the snoring stops within nights. Do you have anybody? Any help? Sorry. Do you have anybody? From not, we have plenty of students who don't practice and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. yeah. But those who practice, it works. There are very few cases where there are systems that can't absorb the carbon dioxide. The damage is so bad that the system can't take it on. But those, I've seen two of those cases in five years. <coughs> Yeah, that'll help. That'll improve. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, all these things that everyone knows that people don't know the cause of, the cause is carbon dioxide deficiency. And the reason why people have different symptoms is because their genetics is different. So people have different genetic predispositions. So you'll get some people get asthma. For us, asthma is the greatest thing because it's a symptom that's directly mm. related to breathing. <coughs> it's a, a surface defense mechanism. It's not deep in the system it's, and it's easy to sort out. But it's lethal. Hmm? It's lethal. Asthma? Yeah. No, it's not. It's only what's lethal is the medication. No asthmatic died young before they actually brought out medications. So asthma is actually, asthmatics are strong people, they live long lives, they, they tend to be quite robust. <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. No, it's not. We retrain the respiratory centre, we do breath holds. Oh, well, I haven't read the book. What's her name? Oh, yeah, Teresa Hale. Yeah. Yes, oh, well, Christopher worked here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah. Teresa yeah. wrote a book. Yeah, yeah and Alexander Starmatsky worked here as well. And Vladimir Sukhanosov. Vladimir's still alive, and he's part of our team. And these practitioners, they, they live in Asia now, and we work via Skype. We br I bring them here via Skype. That's what I do. I, and then other practitioners take them to other parts of the world via Skype because physically it's impossible to travel. So people get access to their skills via Skype now. Well, when they were younger, they traveled around Europe and they, they did a lot of workshops in Australia. And then uh, later on they moved. Uh, Sasha and Vladimir went back to Russia and worked there. And Christopher worked in Asia. So they've been pretty much all over the world in their time. Are there any books on this at all? No, we don't. We, well, Alexander Starmatsky wrote a book called Freedom from Asthma and Insomnia. Mm. He wrote a book on insomnia yes. as well. This book, you, can get it on, you can get it on Amazon. Patrick I've got one I've got. Yeah. Yeah, the cat, Patrick McEwen, um, he's not part of our team. He's, no. oh, he's not. He's not classical. We're classical Bruteca method. Oh. He says not to, I just so, opened it, he said not to try it if you have, if you're having a current treatment for cancer, for this, for that, for the other, for yeah, yeah. all well, sorts of things. He does a diluted yeah. version. Yes, yeah, so it's not, oh, yeah. so we do the hardcore, we, yeah. do, we work with serious cases. Yeah. Well. So I'm which one is your, which book is for this? Well, you can't get it out of a book because we won't teach it out of a book. We mm. only teach you in workshops because you need to be supervised. Mm. Do you no. We've got our ways. We coach the student how to speak to the 
practitioner so that they don't get upset and they support what the patient is doing. Yeah, we some of the person sitting right in front of you had to do all that. So okay. it's oh, we've got to finish, have we? It's half past eight. Oh. oh, okay, I didn't know that. Okay, so then I need to go through the ball law before we stop. Anapanasati. Yeah, I used to do 10 day retreats at uh, Amavati. Very good. Vipassana meditation is at Hereford, yeah. I did Vipassana meditation when I was 20 something. I used to do 10 day retreats with Ajahn Sumedho at um, Amavati. I felt great after the retreat for two weeks and then I was back to how I was. What we do is we retrain the respiratory centre so that you can maintain your work, so that you're always able to reduce your breathing. You can do this practice in Tesco's, you can do it in a public toilet, you can do it anywhere. So meditation's and you, easier? Sorry? Is your meditation easier? No, the practice is easier. Because you get the same results from an hour's worth of meditation in 10 minutes. It's much quicker. Because it's, mm. it's about elevating carbon dioxide. Meditation elevates carbon dioxide. But you can't maintain that level because your respiratory centre will blow it off. So what we do is we retrain your respiratory centre so it doesn't blow off. And I, sorry, I didn't know this talk was only for an hour and a half. Yeah. And um, I wanted to show you the next video, but it's on the video page on the website. But there's one relationship that I want to go through, which is called the Bohr Law. And this is the relationship between carbon dioxide and oxygen. <coughs> Okay, this is called the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. Okay, so what that means is hemoglobin attaches oxygen to it from the lungs. You get oxygen goes onto the hemoglobin from the lungs. Disassociation means splitting. So this curve is about the splitting of oxygen off the hemoglobin. And we call that oxygen uptake. So that's the discharge of oxygen onto, into the cells and the tissues. Now if you have a low control pause of about 10, your oxygen uptake will be very poor. Very little oxygen in your tissues and cells, very bad pH. If you have a better control pause of around 30, you'll have more oxygen in your tissues and cells, better pH. If you have optimal, carbon dioxide in your lungs when you breathe, which is at 7%, and you have a control pause of 60, and you're breathing 3 to 4 litres per minute, you'll have optimal oxygen uptake. So it's to do with the, if you had a car, you'd want the right fuel to oxygen balance. What we're talking about is having the right carbon dioxide to oxygen balance, so that you can drive your vehicle smoothly. Which and is your related to the pH. Yes, because carbonic, all of carbon dioxide converts into carbonic acid. If you keep carbon dioxide and you mix it with water, you'll get carbonic acid. And all the pHs will be referred according to your carbonic acid levels. And when you replace the lactic acid with a carbonic acid, then your muscles will be able to work better. Because lactic acid is okay in the short term, but in the long term it's vicious on the muscles. You know, it causes a lot of inflammation. Most people have got lots of lactic acid. Oh, sorry. So, if you have a low control pause of about 10, so say you have a very low percentage in your lungs, and this triggers your breathing, you'll be breathing quite deeply. Your breathing pattern will be you know, quite big. Someone who's got diabetes, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure, when they walk up a hill, they mouth breathe, they just heave air. They've got a low control pause, about 10. They can't help themselves. They have to breathe because they can't tolerate carbon dioxide. They'll have very low oxygen in their tissues and cells. And they'll be fatigued and confused. If you have 
a higher control pause of about 30 seconds, you'll have you'll breathe when the carbon dioxide level is at a higher percentage, according to this, it goes higher, higher percentage of carbon dioxide, you'll have more oxygen released off your haemoglobin, you'll have a higher level of oxygen in your tissues and cells. If you have optimal carbon dioxide in your lungs before you breathe, you'll have 7% carbon dioxide in your lungs before you actually breathe. <laughs> And you'll breathe very shallow because you'll be breathing three to four litres per minute at the most throughout the day. Uh, sometimes it will be less and sometimes it will be more. And your control pores will be 60. At this point you have very, very uh, high level of oxygen in your tissues and cells. In fact it's optimal. It's not going to get any higher than that because the line goes up. Excuse me, sorry, you know, you probably think I'm a bit... But the thing is, then it's good to have oxygen in your cells, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's what you want. But yeah. in order to get the oxygen into your tissues and cells, you have to have a higher level of carbon dioxide in your system. Yeah. Because it's the carbon dioxide yeah. that releases it off the haemoglobin. It's actually... The, it's, the chemistry is carbon dioxide plus water makes carbonic acid. That's H2CO3. And the H2CO3 splits... <coughs> And it's the acid part that splits the oxygen off the haemoglobin. So it's the carbonic acid that splits the oxygen off the haemoglobin. Mm -hmm. And the carbonic acid that actually regulates your pH. If you train your breathing first, yeah. But you need to train your breathing first. And then you train doing exercise and training your breathing, having trained your breathing. What's your control pause? No, it's no good. You've got to get your control pause up to 30 before you start doing aerobic exercise. Christopher doesn't recommend anyone to do aerobic exercise until they have a control pause of 30. You don't have the budget. <laughs> it's all about the budget. It's, it's money, basically, and... Yeah, James will talk to you about his, he's got a whole system for working out how much money he gains every time he practices. <laughs> Walking is okay? Walking is fine, but you need to, you know... You do this and then. Yeah. Angry. Yeah. If you're, your control pause is... Very bad. Don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing it's is, really it's, low. it's up to you. You've got a low control pause. If your control pause is less than 20, you should do the workshop. Swimming is good. Yeah, it is, yeah. Swimming good health with this. But you're not going to be able to get a higher control pause by swimming, no. You, know, you need to retrain your breathing first. Sorry? Well, it depends what you're doing. But do you, do you, do you, oh yeah, well, it's, it's relaxing. But if you want to stabilise, if you want to stabilise your breathing, this is what will do that. Because diving you'll do for how long in a day? How long do you dive for in a day? <laughs> right, so therefore it's not very much of the day. We breathe for 24 hours a day. So you need to monitor your breathing throughout the whole day. Anyway, I was given the same thing, so in the morning you get up, you go to the window of the door, and you breathe in, and you breathe in, and it's not as possible. And you blow one note, exhale, and then you can type through the other notes. Alternate notes to all the yeah, yeah, well, this is all playing around with the breathing pattern. It's a different thing. We don't play with the breathing pattern. We change the breathing pattern by changing the calibration of the respiratory center. That's what we're doing. We change the breathing center. It's a bit like changing your thermostat on the heating to make sure it's at the right temperature you want it at. Temporarily it will help. It will make you feel better. If it makes you feel better, but it will be temporary. Okay, so therefore, you know, I used to do 10-day retreats. The effect of a 10-day retreat would last for two weeks. And then I'd feel terrible again afterwards. If, I, if you want to get to a place where you feel fantastic all day, all night, every week, Every month, every year, doesn't matter what you do, you feel great. And when you don't feel good, 
you've got a tool to use to get yourself to feel better, you do this. If that's what you want, do this. After, after a month, after doing the workshop and the, the things, what sort of support is there? Well, if you're in trouble, you call in. And you can come to any beginner's workshop? Free after. of charge. Any beginner's begin workshop after the workshop you've attended, you can come to free of charge and you can go to James's support group. How often so do you have the workshops? Every couple of months. We've got one in September, one in November, one in March next year, so forth. Yeah. Can you schedule. get this hmm? on your website? The, the yeah, schedule of the audience. We're not yet, we're, we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you book it today? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, if, you, if you want to just say you want to do a workshop, talk to Marcel. Any other questions? Is it only in, in South Kensington, you say? Is it in Kensington? South Kensington. South Kensington, and then we do them in Victoria as well. Pimlico. Would you be doing it anywhere else? Lovely. Where else? Carol. No, I'm sorry. But if you can get a group of people, we'll come. <laughs>